That's terrific. Our, our next speaker is Dr. James Howe from University of Iowa, who's going to be speaking to us about hepatic resection and liver-directed therapy. Dr. Howe graduated from medical school at University of Vermont and then received postdoctoral education at Washington University in St. Louis and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where he studied uh, surgical oncology. Right now, he's the um, director of the Division of Surgical Oncology and Endocrine Surgery at University of Iowa. He's also one of the few um, surgical oncologists in the country who's not only an expert in neuroendocrine cancer surgery, but also an expert in neuroendocrine cancer laboratory research and an authority on genetic disorders associated with neuroendocrine tumors. So we're really honored to have him speak with us today. Thanks, Ed. Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody, for having me here. I must say that uh, of all the cancers that I take care of, uh, patients with neuroendocrine cancers are my favorite. They're very knowledgeable, uh, and they're very complicated. And uh, we spend a lot of time with uh, each and every one of them, and uh, it's, it's a real challenge because uh, unlike a lot of other cancers, people live for a long time with these tumors, and so we need to figure out how we can extend life and uh, continue to make advances. So what I'm going to talk about today is liver resection and liver-directed therapy for patients with uh, neuroendocrine tumors. And one of the themes that you've heard uh, ad nauseum is the increasing incidence of these tumors uh, in, the, in the population. And the ones that we're most concerned with, with respect to liver metastases, are going to be those of the small bowel, jejunum and ileum and that of the pancreas. And the pancreas accounts for about 6% of all neuroendocrine tumors, and the small bowel about 13%. Now, when you, we see patients uh, with small bowel tumors, about 29% of them are localized. And what that means is they're in the small intestine only, and about 41% are have spread to lymph nodes, and about 30% have gone to the liver or other distant sites. Um, in my practice, it's more like two-thirds of those patients, and I think in most tertiary referrals, it's a, it's a much higher number. This is data from the SEER database, which is a large national database that looks at uh, a variety of sites across the country. Now, for pancreas, about 14% are localized to the pancreas, and almost two-thirds are metastatic at the time of presentation. So this is a big problem with, for patients with small bowel and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So a clinical scenario that I see frequently is a certain individuals come in who had uh, an onset of abdominal pain, and they get a CT scan for some reason. Maybe they thought the patient had kidney stones or ruling out a bowel obstruction or appendicitis, and they get a CAT scan that looks something like this. And what we see, this is a transverse view. In other words, imagine the, the patient's feet are coming out towards you, and the head is in the other direction. And this is a slice across the middle of the abdomen. And what we see are two liver lesions. So these large lesions here. And if we do uh, some, look at some other cuts of the CT scan, this is called a coronal view. Now we're looking up and down and seeing the patient being uh, cut in that fashion. We see this liver metastasis, but also a lesion in the pancreas. And frequently, patients will have a biopsy of the liver lesion. This will show a neuroendocrine tumor. And when we see a lesion in the pancreas, now we know that that's where it came from, and it spread to the liver. Alternatively, the other situation, again, a liver metastasis. But in this case, you see multiple lymph nodes. And there are three of them in this picture, here, here, and here. And those are along the superior mesenteric artery. And this is a distribution that you see with small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, where begins in the wall of the intestine, goes to the regional lymph nodes, and then to the liver. So the question is, how do we treat these patients? There are lots of different options for the liver metastasis, and one of the things you heard from Eric Liu yesterday is the, the first treatment is often surgical. So if you can get the primary out, most of us believe that removing the primary tumor, even in the face of liver metastases, may be beneficial. But what do you do about the liver? There are many different options. One, which you'll hear about more later this morning is embolization. That's when you put beads up into the hepatic artery and you try to deprive it of its blood flow. 
You can do that with beads that have radioactive molecules, like yttrium-90, that's called radioembolization. You can do peptide re receptor radiotherapy, that's where you give a sandostatin molecule with yttrium-90 or lutetium-177, and that will bind to cell surface receptors after given intravenously, and that could bind to the tumors and help kill them. You can just give cold sandostatin, not radioactive, and that can bind to these same receptors and keep the growth tamped down for long periods of time, as you heard yesterday. Or you can give systemic therapy like Dr. Wallen gives. He gives people capcetamine, temozolomide for the, some of these tumors, everolimus, sutent. There are a variety of different options. But one of the problems with some of those systemic therapies is they, they hold the disease in check, but they don't really eliminate it in most cases. And that's where surgery comes in. If you can actually remove a tumor, you can get rid of it. And Dr. Liu mentioned this yesterday. And there's a variety of different techniques. You can take portions of the liver, you can do enucleation, where you shell the tumors out, or you can do ablation, which is where you actually burn or cook the lesion. So let's start by talking about types of resection. If you have a tumor that's limited to, say, the right lobe of the liver, as shown here, here's the tumor, and the liver is divided into eight segments. Two, three, and four is the left side. Five, six, seven, and eight is the right side. And then number one is the caudate lobe, which is something else we don't really need to talk about. But um, if you have a large lesion localized to the right lobe of the liver, you can take out the right half of the liver. That's called a right hepatic lobectomy. Unfortunately, most of these things aren't like that, where they're just a single lesion. Alternatively, if there's another lesion in the left lobe of the liver, you can take out the left half of the liver. And when you take out half of the liver, the, the remaining liver will get larger. It will regenerate or hypertrophy, which is, means it just gets larger and kind of makes up for the part that was removed. If you have even more extensive involvement, you can take out up to about two-thirds of the liver. That's called a trisegmentectomy. And those are big operations, and they're not without inherent danger. And unfortunately, many of our patients with neuroendocrine tumors don't have this nice, simple distribution of one or two lesions. It's often many lesions. And so those techniques are often not optimal. You can do lesser resections. This shows a, a lesion right up in this segment. You can take out one segment. Or you can do what's called a wedge excision, where you kind of come around the lesion with a little bit of normal tissue. Um, or you can do what I mentioned earlier, an enucleation. And this just shows a tumor. You basically go on the surface of the liver. You can excise around the capsule and kind of squeeze it and then come right around it and basically pop these things out. Uh, the tumors are very hard and the liver is very soft and, and, you, and there's often a very nice plane in between them. That leaves, uh, it doesn't usually leave a tumor in the liver and in most other tumors, this would not be an acceptable treatment, like for metastatic colon cancer, you wouldn't do this. But surprisingly, neuroendocrine tumors often don't recur, even if you enucleate them, whereas other tumors do. So this is an option uh, for our patients, especially when they have lots of tumors. It's a way to save normal liver tissue, because when you resect half the liver, you're taking out a lot of normal liver with those lesions. And one of the things that people get in trouble with is eventually liver replacement. So if you take out a lot of their normal liver, you, you have less to work with. Now this is just a kind of complicated slide. I'm sure you in the back can't really read it, but this is a summary of multiple different surgical series, the largest of which was by Sky Mayo's group, which was an international consortium of eight or nine different centers that merged their patients together. So they got 339. And these are other studies uh, where they uh, did resections. A lot of these also did resection plus ablation. Most of these series are biased towards large resections, like hepatectomies. Um, and overall, we see that the mortality rates in, this series, in these series is about 1% to 5%. That's the death rate from surgery. And the five-year survival is about 75%. If we look at that... Sky Mayo paper, again, this is from eight international centers. We can see the survival curve. And basically, it's a little bit complicated, but we, we have a blue line, which means patients that have functional tumors, that means they're hormonally active. And this other line, which I think is in yellow, uh, is non-functional tumors. And 
these R0 versus R1 means how much of the lesions did you get out? R0 means you left no liver tumors behind. R1 means microscopically there might have been tumor at the edge of what you took out. And then this R2 is when liver lesions are left behind. And this is a common situation with people with neuroendocrine tumors because you may have 20 or 30 lesions and there are microscopic lesions that are often be left behind. But even patients with R2 resections did fairly well but overall, in this study, the median survival is 125 months. And what median survival means, half the people live that long and the other half live longer. So that's 10 years median survival with resection. And the five-year survival in this series was 74%. Now, if you look at national databases like SEER and you look at people with metastatic disease, how long do they live? And again, some of these patients had surgery, but the majority didn't have surgery. And this is your control group, which is not a great control, and we'll talk about that in a second, but the five-year survival is 54% if you have metastatic small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, and it's 24 months median survival if you have a metastatic PNET. And that's in contrast to these series where 74% of people had uh, five-year survival. Now, unfortunately, one of the problems with doing major operations is that most people with neuroendocrine tumors will develop recurrence, and at five years, that rate is 94%. So we can do big operations, but the, the problem is there's micrometastatic disease. What that means is that there are little tumors that you can't see that often sandostatin may hold those in check, but over time they may start growing again. And 94% of people within five years, you're gonna see some growth, regrowth, or new tumors showing up. Now, a lot of the medical oncology colleagues that we have don't necessarily accept the survival benefit of, of liver surgery. And there's a lot of debate about, I think Dr. Wolin is pro-surgery, but you can go around the country and you people may have medical oncologists who don't believe that this is very helpful. And the reason is that the standard that medical oncologists adhere to is they like randomized controlled trials. And, and that's basically when you allocate people with the same disease process into group A and group B, say surgery and no surgery, and that eliminates bias so that you can, after five years or so, you can look back and say which group did better and without that bias. Because the problem with this kind of study is there's what we call selection bias. The people who get surgery are in better shape. People who have 90% of their liver replaced by tumor don't end up here. They don't have surgery. So we can make it look pretty good, but we could be taking all the low-hanging fruit in operating on patients who are going to do better even maybe if we didn't operate on them. So that's the counter-argument against surgery. And unfortunately, there'll never be a good randomized controlled trial because patients won't really accept to be randomized to the group that won't get therapy. So this is a difficult question to answer, unlike some of the drug trials where you can randomly allocate people to one group or another. So one way of trying to eliminate the bias of this kind of study is to do what's called a meta-analysis. And this particular study by Yuan looked at uh, studies that had been published that had a, both a surgical and a non-surgical group. And he tried to lump those studies together, and then by lumping them together, eliminate some of those biases, but there's still inherent bias. And what they found was that for symptom relief, this basically shows that if you have dots over here that surgery is favored, non-surgical therapy is favored over on the left here. And they had about an 11 to 1 ratio of in symptom improvement with surgery versus non-surgical therapy. With respect to survival, they also found that there was an odds ratio of 6.1 to 1 favoring surgery over not having surgery for uh, for surgical resection. Now again, this is taking a bunch of studies that are biased and lumping them together, so this doesn't definitively answer the question, and really only randomized trials will answer these kind of questions, and, and as we said, that's not going to happen. So this just shows a patient of mine who was referred with a very large lesion in the center of the liver, which is thought to be unresectable, and one of the dilemmas I have is this is a very large tumor, this is a risky operation, do I submit this person to undergo a, a, re a resection that has about a 5% risk of death, 95% chance of recurrence, I mean, is this the right thing to do? Or should this patient get chemotherapy or some other type of therapy? 
So in this particular individual, we, we resected the central portion of the liver. We lost 10 units of blood. It was a big operation. And 30 months later, he's doing well with no evidence of recurrence. But we know that there's a good chance he will get the recurrence. And this just shows the segment that was removed. It was much larger before, but now the liver has hypertrophied and regenerated so that it's larger uh, than it was before. And you can see that here. This, this originally after the resection, there was a big chunk missing here, and now this part of the liver has gotten much larger to, to compensate for that lost tissue. Now there's some disadvantages of resection. So I want to be pro-surgery, but I also want to be, uh, you know, fair about it. There, there are some risks of having an operation. First of all, it takes about six or, or more weeks to recover from a major liver surgery. As you, many of you know, abdominal incisions hurt and uh, it takes a while to recover. There's a risk of death from these operations, and that can range anywhere from 1% to 3% in experienced centers to as high as 20% in some other centers. There's a risk of major morbidity, and what we mean by that is bad things happen after surgery. You can get an infection in the, in the abdominal cavity. Your liver can leak bile from the edge. You can bleed. Um, and uh, many of these things uh, will happen to people, but most of these are manageable. Most people have bilobar, that means metastases to both sides of the liver. So doing a major resection, again, doesn't always get out all the disease, and it's complicated. So that's one disadvantage of doing like a right or left hepatectomy. And also when you do those operations, you're removing a fair amount of normal tissue at the same time as you remove these tumors. And as we mentioned earlier, the recurrence rates are very high. So what are your other options besides taking out big segments of liver? Well, one is radiofrequency ablation. Uh, and what this is, it uses a probe that looks like this. It's basically a hollow needle that has these tines, almost like an umbrella. And you basically direct that uh, under ultrasound guidance, or in this case, this shows an interventional radiologist doing it under CAT scan guidance. And then you extend these tines and then through these times you deliver electricity that heats up the liver tumor around it and kills it with the heat. Now radiofrequency ablation is just one type of way of doing that and it has some disadvantages. And one is it doesn't cook very well against blood vessels. So the cooling effect of blood will keep the tumor from getting completely cooked along major blood vessels. And it takes a long time. One of, many of us have switched over to what's called microwave ablation which is a probe that looks like this. And at the very end, there's a little generator that generates heat through a microwave. And it's very similar to the radiofrequency ablation, except it'll cook beyond blood vessels and does a, a little bit better job, and it's much faster. And I've gone from, if I have to ablate 20 liver lesions, I can do it in about two hours with this, and this would take me more like six hours. So it's, it's really kind of sped things along. There's another technique that is called electroporation, and that uses a di slightly different probe shown here, and that's also known as a nano knife. And what that does is it kills cells by reversing the polarity on the membrane, causing them to become permeable, and then they just lyse. The nice way, the thing about that technique is it allows the preservation of the inside of blood vessels and bile ducts. So, you can cook lesions right up against these major structures without damaging the normal structures, or not nearly as much as with microwave, where you, can, where you actually cook those things. And you have to be really careful when you're on a major bile duct, because that can cause a stricture or narrowing of the bile duct that will cause problems later on. The problem with electroporation is that the machine for this costs about $300,000, and I was just told that it's, they're going to raise the price to $600,000, and we don't have one in our hospital, because that's too much. And it's not used very often. For people who do have them, like at, at LSU, it's, it's used infrequently, only for certain specific lesions. And you have to put multiple probes in, and it only cooks to a certain uh, diameter of about two or three centimeters. With the other types of probes, this can go up to seven centimeters. You can do about five centimeters with this probe. So the approach to, to liver lesions, multiple liver lesions that I have, and this is, just shows a patient who has two liver lesions, is 
you know, I'll take them to the operating room. Most of my patients still have the primary tumor intact, and I'm going to remove the primary, and I'm going to do the best I can to debulk. Another word for that is cytoreduce. That means get rid of tumors to the best of my abilities. And what I'll do is I'll do mostly enucleations and ablations. If there are big, big lesions, we'll also do uh, wedge resections. And this just shows this patient, and then after I operated, uh, I ablated, in this particular person, 20 different lesions. And you can see two of them here and the ablation zones around them. That Those two are shown here, and there are a couple other things that you can't see on this cut because they're multiple slices, but the, those are ablation zones around other tumors. And if you look at it from more of a coronal view, you see the two preoperative lesions here, and again, those same areas that are cooked. And what happens when you cook these things, it'll basically liquefy or kill those tumors with this heat, and over time, these will turn into what look like cysts. They'll be fluid-filled cavities, and over time, sometimes they'll actually reabsorb, or other times they'll just stay there. So the unanswered questions about hepatic cytoreduction, and what I mean by that is operations to try to remove or reduce the amount of tumors in the liver, is should these only be performed in people with symptoms, or can you also do it in people without symptoms? And that curve I showed you earlier from Mayo suggested there was a survival benefit to, for both symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. Is there a survival benefit? Well, we think so, but again, the burden of proof uh, is, hasn't really been met because none of these are, ret are, are randomized controlled trials, and not everybody believes that there is a survival benefit. Some people believe that we are just operating on the best patients, and again, there, there's a bias inherent in our improved survival rates. There was an old adage that came out in the 1980s from the Mayo Clinic that you shouldn't try to try to reduce somebody unless you can get 90% of the tumors out. And that really came out of nowhere. It was just somebody's statement in a paper with no basis in data. And people have kind of propagated that over the last couple of decades. And now that's being challenged. Can you, is it worthwhile doing if you can only get 70%? And that's something that Rob Pamier's group and Janet Pasika's group have raised a question of. And uh, we'll, we'll present a little data on that in a second. Should you do major resections, or is it okay to do enucleations and ablations? That's another question. Do you want to preserve normal liver whenever you can? Is there a cutoff? If somebody has 100 lesions, do we cut it off there? Do we cut it off at 10 lesions, 20 lesions? What's the, what's the right number? And is there a certain amount of liver replacement by tumor where you should or should not do these kind of operations? And these have not really been well answered. We looked at this in a paper that was just published in January of this year, and we had 142 patients who presented with liver metastases of who we tried to do cytoreduction in 108, or 70% of those. 80 of these patients had small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, and 28 had pancreatic, and I was able to resect the primary tumor in 84% of these cases at the same time. And some of the people in this paper, by the way, are in the audience, and I appreciate them. Uh, you know, allowing me to take care of them. 64% um, of our patients had 70% or greater cytoreduction, and 39% had 90% or greater. And the median number of lesions that we treated in these patients were 10. And for people who had SB nets, they had 19% replacement on average of their liver with tumor. And for people with P nets, it was about 10%. And what we did is we looked at a variety of different factors, and uh, we tried to figure out some of the questions I asked. How much liver replacement? How many lesions? What percent cytoreduction are necessary to have a survival benefit? And in this table, there are two numbers here. There's median progression-free survival, and there's median overall survival. Progression-free means, like if I do something, how long does it take to, for new lesions to show up or the old ones to start growing again? And overall survival is how long do people live? And so we looked at a variety of different factors in our group, like what percent of liver was replaced, if it's less than five versus greater than five. We showed that there was, if you had a lesser amount, you did better. And what we 
what I'm showing here are something called p-values. This is a measure of statistical significance, and if that number is less than 0.05, it means that that probably didn't happen by chance, that there's a real association between what we're looking at and the improved survival. So if you were less than 5% or less than 25%, you did better than if you had more than that. That's understandable. We looked at lesion number, less than 5 versus less than 10. And then the most important thing we looked at is like the, the population of patients in whom we could do 70% side of reduction. And it looked like there was a significant progression-free survival benefit if we could do 70%. And also if we could do 90%. But the only factor of these that was significant for overall survival was whether we could get 70% side of reduction or not. And furthermore, in, these, in this group of patients, 76% had a good biochemical response. And what I mean by that is that if you take their most elevated hormone level, it was cut in half in 76% of patients by doing these cytoreductive procedures. This just shows the survival curve, progression-free survival, and for people that had 70% cytoreduction, it was, uh, was 3.2 years versus 1.3 years in those who couldn't be cytoreduced 70% or more. And for the overall survival, that number, the median survival was not reached. Patients continued to live a long time, whereas patients who didn't have 70% cytoreduction still had a respectable 6.5% year median survival, which uh, is, is not that different from some of the SEER numbers we mentioned earlier, suggesting that maybe if you can't get 70% of the disease, maybe liver-directed surgery isn't a good idea. So with respect to those same questions, I think uh, we've learned that patients will get a benefit even if they're asymptomatic. We think there is a survival benefit. Again, it's based upon retrospective studies. That means in those with inherent bias, but they're the best that we have. I think we've shown that a 70% cytoreduction target is reasonable, and that doing techniques such as ablation and enucleation, which is really what we favor over major hepatic resections, uh, is, is reasonable, because the numbers we have for survival are every bit as good as those people doing major resections. And finally, if you have less than 10 lesions, you did better. If you had less than 25% liver replacement, you did better. So there are other things that you can do besides resection. There's embolization, and Dr. Kennedy will be talking about this in more detail. But some patients aren't amenable to surgery. And the patients that shouldn't have liver surgery are those patients who have diffuse small metastases. Some people have 50 to 100 lesions, and they're all about one centimeter in size. You can't really do a resection of the entire liver without doing a liver transplant, and that will be discussed uh, in the you know, by one of the speakers this morning, but these are not things where you can ablate 100 lesions. That's too many. And if lesions aren't over a centimeter or two, you burn about two centimeters of liver trying to cook a one centimeter lesion. So you can't really do this 100 times and then have much leftover liver. Some people are poor operative candidates. If you see somebody who has uh, cardiac heart disease, uh, or has heart disease and ascites and can't walk across the room, they probably shouldn't have a major liver operation. They're not going to survive. So the patients have to be in decent shape to be able to uh, withstand these procedures. And in those patients, embolization may be a better option. If too much of the liver is replaced, if it's 50 to 75 percent, those patients probably you're not going to do a great job with cytoreduction. And if somebody has a high-grade tumor or somebody, there's a reason to give them chemotherapy or some other treatment, then doing an operation will delay that treatment by six or eight weeks as you wait for them to recover. So embolization is one way to reduce the tumor burden uh, so that you can give therapy more quickly. And then you can control symptoms with this lesser intervention. So that's another uh, indication for doing something like embolization instead of surgery. And Again, this will be discussed shortly, but what embolization in principle is threading the catheter through the groin up into the artery that goes to the liver, and this just shows a hypervascular tumor here with the blood supply here. You basically put particles in that artery that blocks the blood flow to the liver, and that's pretty effective at killing some of the cells, but it's not going to kill the tumor all the way. It's not going to melt away. It, it, it will. It'll put the hurt on it, but it's not going to make those tumors disappear. But it, that can lead to, to some temporary benefits. 
So the pros of doing embolizations, it's less invasive. It's a poke in the groin. You just have to sit down flat for six hours, and usually you go home within a day or so. You can treat diffuse metastases with embolization, and it can help progression-free survival. It can be repeated. You can do the left side, then you can do the right side. You can do, do it again in two years if things progress. And if the patient has a lot of liver disease, you can do the left side and then the right side in different uh, sittings so that you can reduce the risk of hepatic failure, which can happen when you have a lot of replacement. The downsides of embolization, it's less effective than surgery. If you cut out lesions or you kill them with ablation, that's a, it's hard to get much more effect than that. But it, it, another con is it requires a hospitalization. Most people are in the hospital overnight, but there's some people who have significant pain after these procedures, and they may be in the hospital for a couple days. Or if they develop hepatic encephalopathy, which happens when you have a lot of liver replacement, they may be there for longer than that even. It often needs to be repeated. And if you have a high degree of liver replacement, you may get this hepatic failure. Now, one study tried to look at the uh, response rates or survival rates of embolization versus surgery. And the blue curve is surgery, and this is the embolization curve. And they found, again, this is the same cohort of 339 patients from multiple institutions versus 400 patients who got intra-arterial therapy, which is embolization. And the survival in the patients who had surgery was 123 months versus 33.5 months in those people who had embolization. Now, again, this is highly biased. The people who got surgery were better candidates than people who got embolization. So this survival difference isn't really comparable. But what this study tried to do was to do something called a propensity analysis. And what they did is they looked at this, this represents the embolization group, and this is a surgery group. And this basically is the sickest patients over on the left, and this is shows that there were a lot of sick patients who got embolized, and there were a lot of good candidates who got surgery. So what they wanted to do is look at that middle group where they were fairly well matched, and then see how did those patients do, because they knew there was inherent bias in who got which treatment. And what they showed was there was still, in this particular group of patients, there was still a survival advantage for surgery at 84 months versus 39 months. So this is just another slide from that that showed that if you have symptoms, you, you did better with surgery. And if you were asymptomatic, the benefits were not really so great, unless you had less than 25% liver replacement. So my last slide is to just show the algorithm for management of liver metastasis from the European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. And their suggestion here is if you have a, a single lesion or a limited number of lesions on one side, that resection uh, is is in order. If your surgery is contraindicated, then embolization is a better strategy. If you have multiple lesions, which is really the case for most patients, then doing surgery with ablations or staged surgical procedures or what we like to do, enucleations with multiple ablations would be reasonable. And then in those patients where you have diffuse metastases or high-grade lesions, then you might want to go to systemic therapy first uh, and embolization. So I'm going to end there, and I just want to thank you for your attention, and I want to thank my colleagues at the University of Iowa uh, as well for our multidisciplinary clinic and our research efforts.